Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors, everyone. This is Rochelle Vanders Vanden here with Corey Janow. Hello. Hey. So today we wanted to spend some time talking about simple versus complex solutions to problems. And sometimes we get in this rut or in this automatic brain frame, mind frame, all that kind of stuff, where we assume that a complex solution to a problem or, you know, to something that we want to accomplish is better than a simple solution just because it seems fancier or it has better marketing. So we wanted to, to walk through a few things there. It's not that simple is always better. It's just that there are times when simple solutions can be easier and therefore may be the best solution to the problem. So we're going to walk through a few just real life examples that don't have anything to do with money. And then we're going to relate it back to money a little bit. Uh, I do think one good example nowadays is just how regular Joe Smos, everyone stuck at home during a pandemic, are, are trying to deal with mental health, because I think that's been a real struggle with a lot of people lately and, and more of a topic of conversation. I think that that's important, and rightly so, people are talking about it, and that's a great thing. But sometimes I think for, for people that don't have necessarily big mental health issues, but they're just trying to, to create some mindfulness or create some, some better health for themselves, it can get overly complicated. And we can start to simplify it by picking maybe one or two things that are really helpful for us to be able to deal with those things. Or, you know, we can try to do 10, 12 things and pay for subscriptions and all sorts of other stuff. So I can think of one example in my personal life, like I can watch a free YouTube video that's yoga 30 minutes a day. And I feel so much better in so many ways because I feel like I'm doing something for myself physically and mentally. And it's a great like two in one solution for me. And then I get sucked into things like, ooh, there's an app on my phone that can help me be more calm. And then you buy it and then you do this other thing. And then there's so many things that you can just start layering on and make it more and more and more complicated when it's not really necessary because that yoga was a huge help to me to begin with. And if I just stuck with doing that, I would be in pretty good shape. Do you have any other examples you were thinking about, Corey? Yeah. I mean, we could go on for hours Eight. on this subject. Yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah, like you said, mental health, you know, especially the last few years and during the pandemic has, has I think for, for good reason, like become people have become more open about discussing it. Um, but like you said, there's, you know, zillions of different remedies out there that people, you know, marketers and companies try and convince people they need. You got to get the call map. You got to do the breathing exercises. You got to meet with a therapist and take these supplements and, you know, maybe be on these medications for these conditions. And of course, it, you know, it's different for everyone and not to discount, you know, certain things like some people, you know, they, they need certain medications, they need certain treatments, you know, everyone is different. But I found like for me personally, um, you know, there's days or, you know, I'm, you know, not in the best of moods, want to punch a hole in a wall and just overwhelmed, frustrated, angry, whatever, you know, we, we all, we've all been there. But like I've found just personally, if I get at least eight hours of sleep a night, if I get exercise and if I laugh, like I'm good, I'm in good mood, like that simple. I don't need to do all these other things or jump through all these other hoops to, to be in a good mental state, you know, just sleep, exercise, laughter, simple, effective, um, you know, maybe arguably too simple, but I mean, shoot, there's science to back it up. You get enough sleep. That's probably the most important thing you can do for your well-being. You eat healthy, drink water, things like that, but, but make sure you're getting sleep. And then um, there's definitely scientific studies that support exercise and laughter are good for your health, boost your endorphins, put you in a good mood, boost your energy, all those good things. So like if I'm, you know, having one of those days, once the kids are in bed, I'll put on a stand-up comedy, you know, special on Netflix or something and start doing push-ups, sit-ups, and squats, and, you know, within a few minutes, I'm already in a better mood, laughing, and and uh, getting the body moving, so, uh, but again, you know, that that works for me. It may not work for you, but, you know, that's a, a very, an example of a very simple solution where, you know, I don't need to, to do the, the appointments and the, you know, the treatments and the, the drugs and the medicines and all that, all that fancy stuff that, you know, 
maybe the the companies producing those want us to to subscribe to. But um, you know, sometimes the simple solution is, is is the best one for in a lot of circumstances. Mm-hmm. I think it is important to say like, sure, that might be simple, and also not feel doable for a lot of people. <laughs> like right. some, if you're in training and you have kids and like all of this stuff is going on, eight hours of sleep a night might be like your dream life. <laughs> you know, like it might not be possible to do that. So definitely like trying to emphasize the point here, but we totally understand that like this is not real life advice for, for everyone out there. But I do think like as it relates to finances and like what we're doing in life, it does seem like as people get past those very entry level parts of their career, like past training, you know, you're an attending now, you achieve a certain level of status in your career. And it may seem that at that point, like the simple things financially aren't enough. Like maybe at that point, it's not enough to be putting money into our retirement plan and investing in mutual funds or we feel like it's not enough. Like we want things to be grander or more complex to kind of mirror the fact that we feel like our career has matured or our life has matured. And then, you know, maybe that leads to more spending. Maybe it leads to, you know, now we need some additional help and and that could be very reasonable too like maybe you need an accountant an attorney a financial planner and all of that kind of stuff um but sometimes going down some of those paths can make things more complicated than they necessarily need to be and sometimes when you take a simple approach it can be easier to stick with it whereas the complex approaches can sometimes derail us just because of their complexity so it's definitely something to, to tread carefully and make sure that we aren't going too far down those paths for sure i found like you know, a lot of people just get in that that rut of um you know boredom maybe with the basic stuff it's like all right i've been doing this for a number of years like i should be doing something more elaborate i feel like my my situation now calls for especially you know attendings who've been at it for you know a number of years have their student loans paid off they're investing a healthy amount of money in you know between the 401k 403b brokerage account etc and it's like all right what's next i've got you know 500 grand in my brokerage account and i've got you know a similar amount in my retirement plan at work like is this it uh, you know or should i be doing mm-hmm. something something in addition to this you know i feel like this isn't maybe enough because i have friends talking about investing in rental properties or you know private placement, structured notes, you know, real estate opportunities and, you know, the, the, all sorts of fancy schmancy things that, that seem, you know, because they're fancy schmancy and maybe have restrictions on who can invest in or minimum investment requirements. It feels like, oh, if there's limitations on who's allowed in, it must be exclusive. Therefore, it must be better. And, it, you know, maybe, you know, it depends on your circumstances, though. You know, it might be right for you, but it it might not be right for you. And you know, I think, you know, marketers really know how that that our brains think fancier, elaborate, complex must be better for whatever reason, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. You know, for example, you know, if you're you're at a restaurant, what sounds more enticing if you're reading the menu? Uh, you know, a pureed organic nut spread with a grape jelly reduction served on a fresh baked artisan bread or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Same thing. Depends exactly. on who you're marketing to. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> if you're marketing to a five-year-old, you don't want to call it a <laughs> pureed organic nut bread. Exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, one, one sounds like some, you know, $16 item on a, on a menu. I'd be willing to buy it. Sounds delicious. The other one sounds like something you make your kids in a hurry when you don't have anything else to make for lunch for them it's you know example a is fancy restaurant food example b is kid food same thing but it's just how how is it spun um you know i think rochelle you had some other examples uh, yeah yeah i have a couple so one i was thinking about just as we were talking of marketers are also really good at making people feel special and i think that that's a big thing too so i actually had a client that i was talking to the other day and she had gone on just like a 
R and R little vacation to an all inclusive resort. And she got there and they were like, Oh, we want to invite you to this breakfast tomorrow morning. And she was like, What? Why? <laughs> they were like, Oh, just because you're such a special guest and we just really want you to come and you know, we're you're gonna get like a gift card for coming to this breakfast and it's gonna be amazing. And it was and she was like, But why would you do that? And they were like, Just because you're special such a special guest and we're so happy you're here. <laughs> and she felt so great and she was like I'm totally going to this breakfast and then she got there and I think most people know what that was she is just not aware that they were going to try to sell her a timeshare and it was going to be very intense and you know she didn't ultimately end up buying a timeshare and felt like she had some sort of superpower for resisting but you know there's all sorts of things that marketers can do and you know you can pay for a vacation outright or you can buy a timeshare and make it more complex and do all the math to figure out Ooh, is this going to be worth it am i going to come back here this amount of times and in this time period but you know that that more complex product is not necessarily more appropriate than just going on vacation wherever you want to go whenever you want to go and not being obligated to feel like you have to get your money's worth or anything like that um the other like real life example i was thinking of is just the fancier versus simple thing has changed so much in electronics. And I feel like when I go to turn on my TV, half the time I'm like, I don't even know what's happening anymore. Like I push a button and it's like the TV turns on and the Apple TV turns on and the sound bar turns on. And then if one of them doesn't work anymore, then I have to figure out how to turn it all back on and I have no idea what's happening. And it used to be that you could just turn on your TV and that was all you needed to do. And there was no separate sound thing that you had to worry about. And now half the time when something's not working, I have no idea what to do about it. And I feel completely incapable because it's this complex system that it doesn't necessarily need to be, but the marketers have told us, and honestly, my husband has told me that it is necessary to have all of these additional more complex things. But sometimes I wish I could go back to the good old days. That's what you get for marrying a guy who works for an electronics company. I know, darn it. <laughs> the, yeah. yeah, no, couldn't agree more. It's like you turn on the TV, all right, which input do I need to be on to watch whichever thing I want to watch? I got to, you know, go through the different apps. And is that on this remote or that remote? And yeah, invariably one of them gets disconnected and you got to reset it all. But Anyways, so this, you know, this all does kind of tie into investing and, and finances, you know, as we kind of alluded to already, uh, kind of already mentioned, you know, the ones people have the basic stock bond, mutual fund, ETF portfolio, and they've been doing that for a while. They often, especially doctors, no offense, but, you know, doctors feel like they're in a position of status, of privilege. Therefore, they feel like they're investments should mirror that and and it's not you know not just exclusive to physicians like anyone of status whether that be professional status which you know doctor is a in our society a high status profession or could just be income you know plenty of, i know plenty of people who aren't doctors who earn a good income and are in the same boat they feel like hey i make all this money i i've graduated beyond the the basic stock bond mutual fund portfolios those investments are for commoners i'm 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 elite, so I deserve something elite. And you know, they start exploring other things. And it could, it could very well be that that that's great for you. You know, maybe you do want to diversify into some of those other assets or other types of investments. Um, you know, and, and some people are very successful at that. But it, it's kind of boils down to: Do you want that added complexity? Like I've got a buddy um, who I know who, who did really well. Uh, working for a company who IPO'd and, and he, you know, after they went public and his stock options vested and all that good stuff, you know, he, he's more or less financially independent, could stop working completely if he wanted to. Uh, but, you know, he has all this money from from this, this stock and is, starts exploring and getting pitched from, from people at all different angles, all these different investments. And here's strategies we can do to reduce your taxes. Here's how we can shelter them from creditors or litigators. Here's how we can you know, defer capital gains and, you know, a lot of yada, yada, yada. It all sounds fancy in the pitch room and on paper, but uh, eventually got to the point where he's kind of running this stuff by me. And, and I'm like, dude, like, do you want things to be more complex or you, do you want them to be simple? Like either way, you're good. You're, you're financially independent. It's just how complex do you want your, your finances to be? 
you know, up to you. Um, so I think sometimes we got to take a step back and just ask ourselves, you know, do we want the more complex or, or do we want the thing that's just simpler and maybe not as fancy or elaborate and, and who knows what the, the end outcome will be like, but, um, yeah, it's what do you, what do you want? Yeah, and it could be that the complex strategy in some way is marginally better, but we, you don't really know that. If, with most investing things, you don't know ahead of time, that's the nature of investing, like what will be the most appropriate strategy. And even with taxes, you know, we can do our best to plan for taxes, but we don't know what taxes look like in the future either. So that's a, that's a pretty difficult thing to plan for too. For sure. You know, I think some other examples that come into mind of where complex um, from a, you know, a lot of it boils down to the taxes. That's how they get you. Ooh, this strategy is going to help mm -hmm. save on taxes. But you know, the, it often leaves people befuddled, confused, discouraged, and, and regretting pursuing that complex scenario. Like I remember talking to one doctor a few years ago who had previously um, worked with some asset protection company. Like that's all they did, specialize in asset protection because doctors are told they need to protect their assets because they're going to get sued. Um, so they have to, you know, asset protection is a top priority. So, you know, in short, you know, this, this company basically did this elaborate plan for, for, for this guy and his wife um, where, you know, they had their house, their cars, all their accounts and everything owned by some LLC and the LLC was based in, I think, Alaska, because Alaska has certain rules and protections. Um, and then that LLC was owned by another business entity that was set up in Delaware or Nevada or something else. And then like that business was owned by a trust or something. And so like you had this spider web of layers to where, sure, if if this person ever got wanted to if someone wanted to sue them it'd be almost impossible to like even find them let alone get their assets because all their stuff is in you know different entities and businesses and trusts and whatnot but it, it, it really created a lot of headaches for this individual and they were basically like trying to unwind it all they're like every year we got to file all these records and tax returns and these different entities and pay all these record keeping fees and it's, i can't even keep track of it all and this company you set it up said like if they want we they could do it for us but it's going to cost six thousand dollars a year or ten thousand dollars a year or something for them to do all that stuff for us and like we just we don't understand any any of it we don't know where anything is and it's just a big giant headache and they didn't have a ton of assets either. So it was like, you know, I don't even know if, if the, you know, after fee benefit of it was, was really, uh, you know, all that worth it. Um, you know, another. Yeah. And there are some other really simple things you can do for asset protection. Like that's a good example of there are some simple solutions here. And like, it is a good idea to chat with an attorney about these kinds of things and, and get an idea of what their perspective is because it is a matter of, of like legal protection. But even just buying an umbrella liability policy and adding it to your like auto insurance, that's additional personal liability protection you have. It's one phone call to your property and casualty insurance company. It maybe costs like 15, 20, 25 bucks a month to add a million dollars of umbrella liability protection. And you can do more than a million. You can do two million. You can do three million. So that is the most simple thing that you could do in the world. Like so. You know, there's there's other things that are worth exploring before jumping into something very complex and doesn't mean that automatically that complex thing isn't appropriate. It's just, you know, make sure that you're looking at all of your options before jumping into something like that. Yeah, and definitely, you know, consult with a professional in that field. Don't take legal or tax advice from us because that's not our area of expertise. But, you know, these are just some examples we've come across so definitely consult with an asset protection attorney in your state if that's what you're looking for, or a tax uh, specialist in your state, because every state has slightly different rules. But yeah, the tax side is, you know, we, we cross this all the time where, you know, doctors are looking for tax savings metrics and some fancy tax planning firm pitches all these different uh, strategies where, all right, we'll set up these entities and put these assets in this entity and those assets in that entity and funnel all of your income through an LLC or an S-Corp. And then, 
you know, everything's owned by this and you can deduct and, and, and uh, you know, write off things and defer capital gains and, you know, take depreciation on certain assets and properties. And, you know, it's, and yes, like if done correctly, you know, all that stuff can work. Um, the challenge is, you know, often the only person who understands it is the, that professional who's setting it all up and there's a half decent chance you're, you're not going to be working with that individual forever, especially if it's a more transactional event, like you go meet with an estate planning attorney to have your will or trust or estate plan created. You're not often like scheduling semi-annual meetings with your estate planning attorney to stay up to date on it all. Um, and, and, you know, sure, if you have an elaborate tax plan, you probably should be connecting with your tax person, you know, regularly. Um, you know, you just want, you know, better make sure that the person who set up the elaborate plan is, is going to be around for the long run so you can keep working with them. And not to mention laws and rules change over time. So whatever, you know, tax savings metrics work right now, I mean, shoot, by the time this podcast comes out, the tax laws are likely going to be different. And, and some of those tax strategies may not be applicable anymore. And then you got to change things up again. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it is interesting. There are things that are constantly changing over time and you have to just be adaptable. And I think sometimes the simple things are more adaptable than the complex things. That's the other thing that is helpful long term sometimes. Yeah, for sure. I would say just like looking at my existing clients and, and you know, I have some retired clients with eight figure net worths and most of their wealth is in two accounts. Uh, an IRA, a rollover IRA that was, you know, used to be their old employer retirement plan when they were working. And then they have a taxable account where they put a bunch of money in because they needed to save more beyond what they were putting in their 401k at work. Super easy. They take RMDs, required minimum distributions from their IRA every year. And any other money they need would just pull out of that taxable account, you know, to supplement their, you know, social security and the RMDs. And it makes it very simple for the client. Tax return is very simple. You know, the planning is very simple. Their life, they like it, they appreciate it because they don't have to put a lot of thought and energy into it. Um, their kids will understand it when they eventually inherit the money and the and whatnot. So I think the majority of my clients who are either financially independent or on track to be in a timely manner tend to have rather simple circumstances. They, they just live below their means, put a healthy amount of money away and they're in good shape. Now, you know, this isn't to say that that simple is always better. You know, sometimes it, it, it is appropriate to add some more complex things to the equation if, if you know, if it makes sense for you, you understand them and they can really benefit you. Right, Rochelle? Yeah. Yeah, like a lot of times, you know, a trust might not be a very simple thing, but, you know, if you have young kids and you want to be able to, make decisions about how the assets you leave behind for them are, are used for them during their lifetime if you were to pass away like that can be a very very useful tool and it can be somewhat complex but it's definitely helpful um i think another example is if you own your own practice or you and some partners own a practice and you're making quite a large amount of income and you want to save a lot for retirement like cert the first step might be to set up a 401k but once you've maximum funded that, there are other plans that you can potentially set up beyond that, like a, a defined benefit pension plan or a cash balance pension plan. And that can be more complicated, but you can put a lot more money away on a tax deferred basis. Um, and it can, it can be a lot. And that does require a bit of work. You need an accountant, you need an investment manager, you need an actuary, you need these people to make sure that the, the pension plan itself is is functioning the way that it's supposed to. And there's some requirements from the IRS, but it, it provides such a big advantage that it absolutely makes sense for a lot of people who are in that situation where they have a very, very high income and want to have some control over where that income goes and, and when they are getting taxed on it. I think that's one important thing to note about, you know, 401k plans and these cash balance pension plans and things like that. It's not like you're getting out of paying taxes you're just able to defer them to a point in the future when may, you may be in a lower tax bracket. And that can be very advantageous. And it's also potentially after that money has been able to grow for you. 
for sure. Like I have one client that, you know, I think they're, they own their business the revenue, I think is like 700,000 or something or, or like net revenue after their, their, uh, overhead expenses, um, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, husband, wife, both working for the business and, uh, in short, between the 401k and a cash balance pension, they're putting close to 400,000 away pre-tax this year for retirement purposes. And, you know, assuming revenue is consistent, that'll be every year pretty much. You know, their living expenses, they only spend, I don't know, like eight or 10,000 a month between their mortgage and, you know, groceries and all the other stuff. So they, they don't need 700,000 of income and especially they don't want to pay taxes at that income level um, especially they live in a state with some higher state taxes so you know we're able to to one save a large amount for retirement and reduce their taxable income today and then in retirement assuming they're living a similar lifestyle as they live currently and only need you know a hundred thousand a year or so to cover living expenses you know, they're going to be in a much lower tax bracket in retirement if all they have to do is withdraw, you know, 100, 150,000 a year out of their retirement accounts. You know, currently that's, I think, what, the 12 or 22 percent tax bracket? 22, I think. Yeah. yeah but, you know, your effective tax rate with all your deductions and credits, I mean, you probably have like a 15 percent effective tax rate rather than, you know, potentially upwards of 40 percent between federal and state taxes at a 700K level today. So um, obviously things can, can change, taxes change over time. Some years will be higher, some years will be lower. But you know that's a scenario where, all right, adding a little bit of complexity beyond your typical IRA and taxable brokerage account can make a lot of sense. And it's not you know overly complex or elaborate. It's just one extra account that sure it does require you know adding a, a, an investment manager, a tax professional, and uh, a record keeper and an actuary to the equation, but that often is bundled. You know, some of those services are all bundled under one umbrella, so like you don't have to seek them out individually yourself. It's often a combo platter that's all brought to you, and they handle everything for you. And it's just, you know, your accountant files a tax return, your financial planner helps navigate it all with you, and then you know, eventually when you retire, you just roll it all into an IRA, and life's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think obviously there are some examples of where more complex things make sense. And I think the lesson is that whenever you're making a decision like that, you can evaluate the options that are available, look at the simple things, you can look at the complex things, and then decide, you know, is the additional cost perhaps of the complex thing worth it? You know, is the simple thing something that's more sustainable for you? Like, are you going to be able to keep with that complex strategy? Do you need to? Is it something you can do in the short term? And then, you know, that complex thing is done and things get back to being simple. Um, so it's, it's not always black and white. It's not like automatically the complex thing is the better appropriate strategy. It's not always that the simple thing is. It's just that you have options. And I would say one thing is that if the complex strategy that you're being presented is something you really don't understand, it might not be the best fit. Like it, it's, you don't have to understand all of the nuts and bolts of everything that you're doing. Like that's why you have professionals that are helping you, but you do need to have a basic understanding of how that's really helping you before you really, before I think it's worth it to, to jump in and, and do something without fully being aware of all of the, the consequences and costs and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I think having at least a base level of understanding of it all is important. Um, you know, if, uh, and otherwise it's, it's just odds are things are going to get confusing. You'll forget things. You won't do it appropriately. Um, or if professionals change, then, you know, it may not transition as smoothly as you hoped. So I'm a big fan of keep things as simple as possible, but you know, you don't, go out of your way to make it more simple than necessary because that could have some some adverse consequences but you know keep it as simple as possible and and life will probably be a lot smoother and easier for you so and only implement the more complex stuff if it if it either your situation really does call for it and it's clearly the best option available to you and you kind of understand why 
or I mean, shoot, maybe you do just you you, you want something more complex. You're interested. <laughs> in it. You, like, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely. So, uh, but that's not everyone's uh, everyone's interest, you know. So. Well, anything else, Rochelle? No, I think we're good. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, not sure when we're getting this out there, but I hope either you have a good holiday or you did have a good holiday. I know we're, we're coming up on all of those big events right now. This is early December when we're recording. I'm guessing this one will probably be released in January, but we'll see. So happy new year. Happy everyone. new year. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Thanks, good. everyone. We would love to hear your feedback and suggestions for future topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing podcast at thefinitygroup.com or by following Finity Group on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Finity Group LLC. You can follow me on Twitter at Corey Janoff CFP, Instagram at Corey Janoff, or on LinkedIn under my name, Corey Janoff. You can follow me on Twitter at Rochelle Finance or on Instagram, Vanderzanen Rochelle, or on LinkedIn under my name, Rochelle Vanderzanen. Check out all of the podcast episodes on the affinitygroup.com slash podcast on our Finity Group YouTube channel or your favorite podcast app. And don't forget to check out our Financial Clarity blog at thefinitygroup.com slash blog. Thanks for listening to this episode of Financial Clarity for Doctors by Finity Group, LLC.